Hi folks, this is the video version of a presentation I was asked to do for our local photo meetup club. I was originally asked to do a presentation on Lightroom. I asked for questions in advance and the most popular question I got was, what is Lightroom and why would I want to use it anyway? So rather than starting with Lightroom, I thought I'd begin with a presentation on the essentials of digital photography to get everyone to the same place to begin with. This is very basic, but it covers the essentials. I thought I'd start with a quote from Ansel Adams, one of the vanguard photographers of the early 20th century. If you're not sure who Ansel Adams is, you're probably watching the wrong video. So first question, is this a photograph? And yes, this is a trick question. This is a digital image, but is it a photograph? How about this one? This is a three image HDR composite made at Cathedral Grove here on the island. Basically, I made three exposures with different light meter settings and then combined them all using software to make one final composite. How about this one? This image was made from 16 images shot in a row and then joined together into one file using software. Again, this image was made from 18 images shot in a panoramic line and then stacked together into one frame. This scene does not exist. This is a graphic representation of a computed iteration of a mathematical formula, <laughs> more commonly known as a fractal. It looks like a dragon, at least to me, but it's just numbers. The bottom line is that digital images aren't things. They don't exist in that sense. All digital files are essentially electrical signals represented in the computer as binary code. This is a light switch, but it represents a very simple computer because it's either on or off. If it's on, there's electricity passing through it, and if it's off, there isn't. In computer terms, it's either a 1, on, or a 0, off. The smallest value, a 1 or a 0, represents a bit, so every bit has two possible choices. 8 bits together represents 1 byte, and since 1 byte represents 2 choices per bit for each of 8 bits, or 2 to the 8th power, 1 byte represents 256 possible choices. We'll come back to this in a bit, pun intended. Now each one of these little colored squares represents a pixel. Each pixel has two things, a location in terms of space, so far over and so far up, and a color. In a 32-bit operating system, each pixel is represented by four bytes of information, at eight bits per byte. So while the number here is just the sequence I made up, a sequence of ones and zeros like this represents a pixel. So how do you make an image out of ones and zeros? Well, something like this. So before we go any further, we need to develop a common language, a basis of understanding about digital photography. Now, some of you may know some or all of this. Some of you probably know much more than I do about some of this, but I think it's important to cover it just so we're all working from the same dictionary, so to speak. We're not going to go into any great detail. If you want more information on any of this, there's plenty of it available online. There are basically two different color models, additive and subtractive. To begin with, black is not an absence of color. White reflects all colors and black absorbs all colors. Now in an additive process, you start with no color and then you add colors to it. The RGB, or red, green, blue, is the most commonly known additive color model. A computer monitor, for example, is emissive, meaning it gives off light. If you start with nothing and add varying combinations of red, green, and blue, you end up with all the different colors possible. How many colors that is depends on several factors, as we'll see in a moment. In a subtractive process, you begin with all colors, but since they're blended together, you can't see them. And then you begin to filter out colors. The CMYK, or a cyan, magenta, yellow, black color model, is used by computer inkjet printers, for example. You start with a white sheet of paper, which reflects all light, and then you add inks that absorb some of the reflected colors. If you add enough ink, you absorb all of the colors and create black. By the way, K is used for black because in color separation printing, each of the four colors is printed on its own separation sheet. The black one is used as the key or reference file for the other three colors, so K is for key. Although I started with pocket cameras and Kodak Instamatic cameras, my first real camera was my dad's Argus. These cameras were made in the early 1950s, and some of them are still in use today, 
This camera has no light meter, guest focusing, four shutter speeds, five f-stops, all of which is contained within the lens. In the film days, a camera was essentially a box that held film. As technology progressed, they added light meters, shutters, electronic bits, autofocus, and more, but the main event was all about the film used and the way it was processed. This is a baking sheet, but it'll serve our purposes for the moment as representing a piece of film. Celluloid was used for film until the mid-1950s, but it was originally developed in the mid-19th century as an alternative to elephant ivory for billiard balls. Playing pool had become very popular and, well, they were running out of elephants. Before film, people were using glass plates, tin, even paper as substrates for their images. To make black and white film, you'd begin with the film substrate and then add a gelatin emulsion with light-sensitive silver salts to the film. To make color film, you'd begin with your film substrate and then coat it with at least three different color sensitive layers. Some of them had as many as 10 or 11 layers, but the three basic ones were red, green, and blue. You still had silver salts, just in at least three layers. Blue light would get stopped in the blue layer, green light would pass through the green layer, and red light would get stopped by the red layer, and so on. Once you'd exposed your film, it was off to the darkroom. And from there, it was all about chemicals. In black and white photography, you'd wash away the silver salts that hadn't been fixed by the light, and in color negative film, for example, the silver in the color layers would eventually be converted to dyes. Red produced a cyan dye, green produced a magenta dye, and blue produced a yellow dye. Now in the digital world, some things are very similar and some things are very different. We refer to a DSLR as a camera because it has a lens stuck on the front of it, but it's no longer just an empty box for film. A digital camera is a computer with a lens, just as a cell phone is not really a phone, but a combination of computer and two-way radio. As a computer, a digital camera has electronics, memory, a central processor or a CPU, and a monitor or two. One is the rear LCD screen, and the other depends on whether you have an optical viewfinder or an electronic one. It has software or firmware, and an input device, which is usually either a button or your finger on the screen. This is a muffin tin, but for our purposes, it represents a digital sensor. There are essentially three kinds of digital sensors. CCD, or charged coupled device, used in medium format cameras. CMOS, or complementary metal oxide semiconductor. And Foveon, which is a type of CMOS sensor used in Sigma cameras. There are differences, but I'm not going to get much into what they are. If you're interested, you can look online. Now these are electronic circuits, they're not just digital film. Each well in the sensor is a sensor, and you'll notice they have depth as well as size. Early digital sensors had round sensors with spaces between them like this, but more modern ones use square sensors. Each sensor is like a little solar panel in that it receives light or photons coming through the lens and converts the photons into an electrical signal. The sensors are very small in the order of 6 to 10 microns or so, and each sensor represents one pixel. By the way, a micron is a thousandth of a millimeter. Now, the number of sensors and the overall size of the sensor itself determine the resolution of the sensor. The bigger the sensors, the fewer you can fit on the one chip and the less resolution you have. But if the sensors get too small, they can't process enough of a charge to be effective. And you get a very low signal to noise ratio and crappy looking images. You may have heard of achromatic cameras with black and white sensors. I'll let you in on a secret. All sensors are inherently black and white. In order to define color, most CCD and CMOS sensors overlay the sensors with color filters in what is known as a Bayer pattern. There are a few other patterns as well. In a Bayer pattern, the sensors are grouped into fours with two green, one red, and one blue filter per group. The human eye is more sensitive to green light than it is to red or blue. The filters block out the other light colors so the amount of light and the electrical signal for each sensor is changed depending on the nature of the light. The electrical signals for each pixel are run through either a 12-bit or a 14-bit, and we'll get into what those numbers mean in a minute, ADC or analog to digital controller and convert it into binary data. Because each pixel only gets red, green, or blue data, and all three colors are required for each pixel, 
A process called linear demosaicing tries to interpret what the values for the other two colors for each sensor should be from the surrounding sensors. The Foveon X3 sensors use a three-layer pattern like film with RGB layers on each sensor. Okay, I see this online all the time. This image is straight out of the camera. This is a lie. It always has been. The real question is, who is processing your images? As we've seen, all cam digital cameras create RAW files. RAW files are created by photons reaching the sensor, converted into electrical signals, run through an ADC to convert them into binary data, and then minimally processed through the camera's software. What that means exactly depends on the camera manufacturer, and they're not telling. One considers a RAW file to be like a film negative. While processing will affect the film, what you end up with is the maximum amount of information available about that image. The real question is, are you going to let the processing power of the camera and software written by a technician process your images, or are you going to use the processing power of a computer and your skills and choices to process your images? There are no right or wrong answers, but your choices affect the outcomes and you need to understand them. All digital cameras can produce JPEG images from the raw data, which is what results when the raw data is run through the camera software to assign a white balance, contrast, and other image effects, which is then compressed and saved as a JPEG file. JPEGs have both advantages and disadvantages. The advantages of a JPEG are a smaller file size, they're faster to work with, JPEGs are a universal format, and for some work, they're good enough. The disadvantages is that JPEGs are 8-bit, they use a lossy compression, so you imagine squeezing an orange and having some of the juice run out. JPEGs degrade with use, so if you open a JPEG file in something like Photoshop, don't change it, just open it, save it, close it, open it, save it, close it, open it, save it, close it. Every time you do that, you're throwing away information. The, the image file is actually degrading. And the other disadvantage of a JPEG file is that several parameters of the image are preset in the camera. That may or may not be what you're looking for. Now, RAW files represent, as much as possible, all of the image data captured by the camera. RAW files must be processed in order to create something that looks like a photograph. There are advantages and disadvantages to using RAW files as well. The advantages are RAW files are 16-bit. Now there's an asterisk there because no camera today creates a 16-bit image file. There are 12-bit images and 14-bit images. There are some scanners that can create 16-bit images, but we're getting pretty fine here. The advantage of a RAW file is they have much larger dynamic range and they capture much more data. They're also lossless. You're working with all of the information captured by the, film, by the camera. Disadvantages, you're dealing with a larger file size. You need a raw converter in order to take that data and convert it into something that looks like an image. And there are many proprietary raw formats. Camera manufacturers seem to want to create a new raw format for every new camera they produce. You may, depending on how long you've been around computers, you may remember floppy disks, zip drives. Um, if you've been in digital photography, you may remember Kodak PCD files, things like that. None of those things today can be accessed very easily anyway. There's a couple of software packages that will open a PCD file for you. So all of these proprietary formats, one of the questions is, will you be able to open your images five or 10 years from now? Now, RAW files versus TIFF files. Well, a TIFF file is a processed version, a 16-bit processed version, but it's no longer a RAW file. What about Adobe DNG? Well, a DNG is a RAW format, but it's open source. It was created by Adobe as one way of getting around the greater accumulation of proprietary RAW formats. Being open source means that anyone who wants to can write software that will work with DNG files. 
in later versions, uh, they've created lossless and lossy options because sometimes you don't need the full lossless data. Um, and it, if you're concerned about maintaining your original RAW file, you can embed that RAW file within the DNG. Some people like them, some people don't. I leave it up to you. So, 8-bit versus 16-bit. So what? It's not a big deal, is it? Actually, it is. I borrowed these from the Crayola website. I hope they don't mind my using them. <clears throat> but on the left, you have the box of eight Crayola crayons. You have yellow and green and red and orange and purple, etc. On the on the right, you have a box of 120 crayons. So instead of having just one yellow, you have, say, three or four. You have four or five blues. You have a greater variety of colors. There's more more variability, more more definition, if you will. Now, back to bits. Since each bit has two possible states, on or off, a byte, or 8 bits, can therefore represent 256 states, 2 to the 8th power. Since there are three color channels, uh, in a, on an 8-bit monitor, you can have 256 times 256 times 256, or 16.8 million colors. A 16-bit image can handle 65,536 discrete levels of information instead of the 256 levels that an 8-bit image can. So in an RGB image, this translates into 65,536 times 65,536 times 65,536 or 281,474,976,710,666 levels of information. Now, the human eye can see a maximum of about 10 million colors, and there are today no 16-bit monitors on the market. So why is this important? Well, where this is important is the amount of information available to work with. Imagine burlap versus silk. The biggest difference comes when you start manipulating the image, the change in contrast, for example. A piece of burlap is woven together, but it's very coarse. And if you start pulling and pushing on the burlap, then you're going to wear a hole in it pretty quickly. Silk is also cloth, but the weave is much finer. The, the threads are smaller, and they're woven much tighter together. You can pull and stretch, and, and it has much more resiliency. So a 16-bit image has also has more resiliency when you start pulling the tones apart by increasing the contrast and, or changing the light values, whereas an 8-bit image can only stretch so far before you literally pull the colors apart and you end up with gaps in the data. This is called posterization. Okay, now dynamic range refers to the number of separate luminance tones in a scene or in an image. Not all scenes have a broad dynamic range, the black cat in the coal bin or the white hair in the snowstorm, for example, but some do. In the film days and with early sensors, the camera was capable of recording of about five stops of dynamic range. So if you had a scene with, say, 12 stops of dynamic range to capture everything you needed to make multiple exposures to capture the low end, the mid range, and the high end, you then combine that information into one file. And this is the essence of HDR. The rest of what people talk about as being HDR is tone mapping, but we're not going to get into that. Now, under perfect conditions, the Nikon D800E, for example, is capable of capturing 14 stops of dynamic range. So the definition of HDR has changed somewhat. It's important to remember we're dealing with two different sets of values, actual values and perceived values, what we can see with our eyes, what our monitors or prints can show us. As with colors, there's actual dynamic range, and then there's visible dynamic range, and that varies from person to person and from device to device. Now, since there's a range of luminance values, if we had eight stops of dynamic range in our camera, each one of those columns would have a range of tones. Eight stops gives us two to the eighth, or 256 luminance values, ranging from zero, black, to 255, white. Anything that is pure black or pure white has no color information, so that information is said to be clipped. Since there are red, green, and blue color channels, clipping can occur in one, two, or all three channels. If we stick with our theme of eight stops, or 256 tones divided into eight columns, 
you would think the capability of your sensor to capture information from black to white would be equal, something like this, with 32 bits of space available per column. Unfortunately, digital sensors don't work that way. In the film days, especially with slide film, it was common to underexpose the scene a little in order to bring out better color saturation. In the digital world, that's not a good idea. This brings us to ETTR, or exposed to the right. The idea is to set your exposure to be as bright as possible without creating clipping. You don't want to get into pure white because once you do that, you've lost color information. So let's forget about electronics, cameras, etc. for a moment and think about water instead. Let's assume we have a pitcher with 256 milliliters of water and we have eight glasses. Except the glasses are not all the same size. The biggest glass is the lightest one and it's capable of holding full half of the water we have. The next glass down can hold half of what's left and so on. Now any water we pour into the frame to the right of that lightest glass is clipped. It's going to be poured onto the table and wasted. And the same is true for anything for the darkest one on the left. If we try to overfill the glasses, we waste water too. However, going back to cameras, if we try to pour too much information into the dark tones by underexposing our image, the sensor won't be capable of capturing it. This is why it's important to expo expose as close as possible to the right without clipping to capture the most information possible from the scene. Processing what we have captured comes later. At this stage, we're only trying to gather all of the information we can. This is a histogram from an image processed in Lightroom. In this case, the histogram or the exposure is almost perfect. Most of the information for the scene is captured in the lightest tones where there's the greatest capacity to use that information and much less in the darker tones. This is the image from which the previous histogram was generated after processing. It's an image of Brentwood Bay and the image itself is hardly worth keeping. However, from an exposure perspective, it's a great example. You can see from the clouds and the sky that there are lots of light tones, but there's no clipping, no lost information. Ditto in the shadows. We've captured all of the possible information from the darker tones around the pier and the shoreline in the foreground, but again, there's no clipping. Okay, we have one last thing to define before we move on, and that's digital asset management. To me, this is the most important feature of digital photography to get right, and I'll tell you why. For most people, this is what image organization looked like in the film days. People put their images in photo albums, sometimes in, in sleeves, sometimes everything ended up in an old shoebox. Finding a specific image could be challenging, to say the least. This is what image organization looks like in the digital age. People store their images on DVDs or on a hard drive somewhere, but the point is that there's no inherent logic as to where or how to store your images. Remember, we're not talking about individual photographs. What we're talking about are tiny electric impulses coded as ones and zeros and stored primarily on magnetic media. How you organize this information within your operating system, whether Windows, Mac, Linux, or whatever, is entirely up to you. People have 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 images on their storage drives. But the real question is, how easy is it for you to be able to find the one image you're looking for? Now, digital images consist of two parts. There's the image data and metadata. The image data is the string of ones and zeros that make up the pixels that represent the image itself. Metadata is information about the image. There are essentially two types of metadata, EXIF and IPTC. EXIF metadata is information captured at the moment of exposure. In the film days, this was done, if at all, using a paper and pencil. But with digital cameras, the camera itself records a lot of information and stores it with the image. There's the camera make, model, serial number, the lens, the focal length, the aperture, the shutter speed, the ISO, the time, the date, the GPS location, if you have that enabled, and more. IPTC metadata is information added after capture and can include the photographer's name, contact information, copyright information, keywords, etc. In RAW files, the metadata is stored in a separate file called a sidecar file or an XMP file. 
of JPEG, DNG, PSD, and TIFF files, the metadata is stored within the image file itself. Again, in the film days, IPTC metadata was mostly a pen on the back of a print recording, Martha, Aunt Martha, 1952. <coughs> Excuse me. And now for the moment you've all been waiting for. What is Lightroom? Do I want it? And why would I need it? Actually, we're not quite there yet. There's an elephant in the room, so to speak. Photoshop was first developed around the time digital scanners were invented, and for the past 20 and more years, Photoshop has been used primarily by graphic artists and designers. Since a pixel is a pixel is a pixel, when digital cameras came along, people started using Photoshop to process their digital images as well. Um, now, Photoshop is sometimes called the 800-pound gorilla of graphics programs, and while there are others like GIMP or Corel PhotoPaint, Photoshop is the de facto standard for most graphics professionals today. It's important to understand that while things have changed a lot over the years, Photoshop is at its heart a pixel editor. While you can use layers to make your work non-destructive, every time you save a Photoshop file, you're overwriting what was there before. You're changing the file information itself. Photoshop is also part of a trifecta of Bridge, Adobe Camera Raw, and Photoshop. Bridge is essentially a file browser, a little fancier than, but similar to Windows Explorer or Mac Finder. Adobe Camera Raw is the raw conversion aspect of Photoshop. Adobe Camera Raw is bundled with Photoshop, and Adobe doesn't have a Camera Raw icon I could find, so I had to improvise my own. But if you open a raw file in Photoshop, it will open in Camera Raw as the, first, the file first has to be translated into a format that Photoshop can use. Photoshop, as I'm sure everyone knows, <clears throat> is an image processing program. So, here we are. Adobe Photoshop Lightroom. Do you need it? The correct answer is maybe. It depends. Let's look at what it does and doesn't do. Lightroom is essentially a database program, so it can handle your digital image management needs quite well. In addition to reading and storing XF and IPTC metadata, Lightroom will allow you to add keywords, star ratings, color labels, flags, and more. And once you have all this information in the database, you can use it to search and or filter based on certain criteria. Creating and maintaining a healthy workflow for your images is very important. As I say, you may have 100,000 images in your Lightroom catalog, but the important thing is, can you find one? Second, Lightroom is one of several raw conversion programs like Adobe Camera Raw. Others include Bibble, Canon DVP, Nikon NX2, Capture One, ACDC Pro, DXO, and Aperture. Now Lightroom uses a parametric processing pipeline, which means that Lightroom never touches your image files unless you tell it to. There's no save button in Lightroom because it isn't necessary. What Lightroom does is create a history of steps for each image, describing the changes you've made. These changes are applied during output and a new file is created. One can also hand off an image from Lightroom to Photoshop, for example, for other work, and then save the file and have the Lightroom image automatically brought back into Lightroom. And then finally, there's Lightroom output, whether you output it to a file, to a print, to a book, to a slideshow, web gallery, etc. So that's got us to the front door. And um, I wanted to take a moment before ending this presentation that all of the images I used here that were not mine were from those available on mine, mostly under Creative Commons licenses. So this is a list of the original sites and the owners for images on each slide. My thanks to all of them for allowing me to use your work. And finally, another quote from Ansel Adams. I think it's a very good one. If you're interested, this is um, our website, m and Musings, and uh, we write on a number of things. There are also, among those, um, tutorials on Lightroom, on photography, and a number of different aspects. And uh, you're welcome to come by and check them out. Hope to see you there. Take care. Bye now.